Hey guys, welcome to Spec Transfer and to Topic 3.7.3, .3, Evolution May Lead to Speciation from the AQA A-Level Biology Specification. As always, let's start with a look at our specification. Now, a lot of what is mentioned here was already covered in previous topics. This includes things like the concept that individuals within a population of a species may show a wide range of variation in phenotype and how this is due to genetic and environmental factors. We also know that mutations are the primary source of genetic variation and that meiosis and random fertilization of gametes during sexual reproduction also produce further genetic variation. We've also already covered how predation, disease and competition for means of survival result in differential survival and reproduction, i.e. natural selection. We've also already covered how natural selection works, i.e. organisms with phenotypes providing selective advantages are likely to produce more offspring and pass on their favourable alleles to the next generation. Over many generations, the frequency of the more favourable alleles increases in the population and so therefore does this trait. We have also covered stabilising and directional selection. This part of the specification then just adds disruptive selection, which I'll cover in just a moment. The specification then also moves on to how evolution is a change in the allele frequencies in a population, and how reproductive separation of two populations can result in the accumulation of differences in their gene pools. This leads on nicely to speciation, and the specification mentions allopatric and sympatric speciation in particular. Finally, the specification wants us to know about the concept of genetic drift in causing changes in allele frequency in small populations. So just to summarise, this part of the specification is basically just a little development on things that we have already learnt before. To recap things such as variation, genetic mutations, meiosis and the random fertilisation of gametes during sexual reproduction, as well as the principles of natural selection, including directional and stabilising selection, just follow the links to my previous videos top right, or follow the links in the video description. So let's make a start. As mentioned, we have already covered variation, as well as the principles of natural selection and stabilising and directional selection. In this part of the specification, we have to also know about disruptive selection, so let's start with this. Disruptive selection is where individuals with alleles for characteristics of both extremes at either end of the range are more likely to survive and reproduce. An example of disruptive selection includes squirrel tail lengths. In disruptive selection, the mean stays the same, and the mean becomes less common, resulting in a greater standard deviation, i.e. a greater spread of values about the mean. So let's have a look at the example of squirrel tail lengths in a bit more detail. Of course, the example of squirrel tail lengths probably won't come up in your exam. They'll probably give you a different example, but it's the general principle of disruptive selection that will always be the same. Let's start again by mentioning that squirrel tail length has a genetic basis. Random mutations over time mean that there is genetic variation in tail lengths within the population. Our selection pressure is the ability to avoid predators. Squirrels with shorter tail lengths are less at risk from being caught by predators, because it is not as easy for predators to latch onto the tail from behind, and squirrels with longer tails find it easier to keep balance on trees and can hereby more easily avoid predators. Individuals with alleles for short and long tail lengths are more likely to survive, reproduce and pass on the advantageous alleles to their offspring. Over many generations, the frequency of alleles for short and long tail lengths increases in the population and so therefore do these traits. Next we need to know about evolution and speciation. We need to be able to define evolution as the change in allele frequencies in a population. New species develop from a common ancestor, which is a process known as speciation. How does speciation happen? First of all, part of a population becomes separated from the others, and so becomes reproductively isolated. Each population finds itself in a different environment, and so experiences different selection pressures. Natural selection occurs, and different alleles are of an advantage in the different populations. Allele frequencies change in the two gene pools. Eventually, the two populations are so genetically different that they can no longer interbreed to produce fertile offspring. They are considered two different species. So, how could reproductive isolation occur? There are two types of speciation that we need to know about, allopatric and sympatric speciation. In allopatric speciation, we have physical reproductive isolation, for example, when species become separated by a river or a mountain range. Sympatric speciation is when populations don't become physically separated, but there is some other reason for reproductive isolation. 
This reason, for example, may be behavioral, temporal, for example, some individuals in a population of plants may begin flowering at a different time of year to the rest, or mechanical, such as a change in the genital structure, meaning that reproduction is no longer possible between the two species. Finally, we need to know about genetic drift. Evolution can occur by natural selection, but evolution can also occur by genetic drift, which is when allele frequencies change due to chance. Why could this happen? There are multiple reasons. For example, not every individual will become a parent. Also, not every individual will have the same number of offspring. Fundamentally, chance rather than selection pressures dictates which individuals survive, reproduce and pass on their alleles. Note that genetic drift has a greater impact on smaller populations, because each individual makes up a greater proportion of the population. To illustrate this, in a smaller population there is a greater chance that one individual is the sole owner of one allele. If this individual were to die out, this has a much greater impact on the population than if many more members of the population share the same allele. Natural selection and genetic drift work alongside each other in driving evolution. However, one may drive evolution more, depending on the size of the population. Genetic drift doesn't cause species to become better adapted to their environment. Great, that would be this part of the specification covered. We know that individuals within a population of a species may show a wide range of variation in phenotype and how this can be due to environmental and genetic factors. We know that mutations are the primary source of genetic variation and how genetic variation can also be increased through meiosis and random fertilization of gametes during sexual reproduction. We've also covered the principles of natural selection, and we now know about disruptive selection in addition to stabilizing and directional selection, which we covered before. We are able to define evolution as a change in the allele frequencies in a population, and we now know how speciation works, in particular allopatric and sympatric speciation. Finally, we have covered the importance of genetic drift in causing changes in allele frequency in small populations. That would be it for now guys, thanks for watching, please subscribe, comment, next time we will be covering populations in ecosystems.